So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Martin, Martin Lusovac. I'm an assistant professor here at law school um, at LSE. Um, thanks everyone for coming, even though it's, well, the end of the term uh, and strike uh, day. So we uh, appreciate this uh, a lot that you come here today to join us. Um, I would also like to thank, hi, Daniel, <laughs> welcome. Uh, I also would like to thank um, uh, Center for Commercial uh, Legal Studies, uh, University uh, of Queen Mary, that uh, co-organized the event with us, particularly thank, uh, Duncan Matthews. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd like to thank our speakers and also in the background, Becky and Alex, who helped to put this together. Um, I'll introduce speakers in a second. But before I do that, uh, a few words about, um, well, our today's author and the book. Um, and I'm just no uh, expert on biotech and, uh, well, George claims that I know something about patent law, but I still have my doubts. Uh, so what I would like to say about this book, it's, it's a book that you are actually interested in reading, even if you're not a patent scholar. And the reason for that is because but George, what George basically tried to do here, it's his debut in a way. He tries to verge into uh, your local library uh, because he thought SSRN is boring. Uh, so he now tries to sort of crawl into your local library, um, writing in a gripping style, as some of the reviewers would, uh, would note. And um, when I started reading, I haven't finished reading the book, I have, to, I have to admit that, but after I started reading the book, I at first had a feeling that uh, George was kind of trying to emulate this famous uh, writer that lawyers like, um, John Grisham. Uh, but uh, today over lunch, uh, I understood that he was not trying to emulate John Grisham, but someone else, uh, Isaac Asimov, in fact. Uh, but I think he had to stay too close to reality, uh, given his field. But I think his next sequel to this actually very likely will be something more um, in the line of work of Isaac um, uh, Asimov. So, uh, well, watch the space because I think this is where George is going next. But even in this book, you know, he couldn't resist because you, you actually read about Jedi in this book. Uh, you, uh, you read about all sorts of interesting twists twist and turns and how litigation is conducted in the US. And I think in overall, uh, what, what you read about is this is a fantastic case study about impact litigation and how ACLU um, works in the United States, and I think that's quite a fascinating story. Besides all the fascinating stories within this book about patents and human genome. All right. So with this, I think I'm, uh, I embarrassed George enough um, to ask him to join us, um, and I ask George to quickly introduce the book, and after that, I'll introduce our uh, speakers and head over to them one by one. Okay, George, would you like to come? All right, thank, uh, thank you so much, Martin, for that uh, kind introduction and for your, uh, your kind words about the book. I, I thought I would just give a few words about why I wrote this book as, as a law professor. Um, and, and this book is about a case that in the United States is a, a famous case, right? This case has been studied. Uh, it's in the law textbooks at this point. It's 10 years old uh, right now. It was a unanimous decision by the US Supreme Court uh, that was significant for patent lawyers. Uh, because it had a major impact on our patent eligibility doctrine, what is or is not eligible subject matter for patents. And so that alone uh, would make it a very attractive subject of law review articles, and I and many other law professors in the U.S. and elsewhere have written about this case for an academic audience. But the case was about a lot more than this doctrinal patent law question, right? It, it involved aspects of access to health, right? How people um, can or cannot af access affordable uh, health care in the United States, which is a big issue. It's about scientific innovation. Uh, what do scientists do? What makes them do what they do? It's about policymaking within the government, right? Not just the courts, but the Obama administration, various offices, the White House, all got involved in this case in very surprising ways. Um, it is also a kind of a moral story about the individual and our genes and what it means to have ownership over them. And finally, 
It's about self-knowledge. Can we actually know, or are we restricted in some way from knowing what is contained in our genes? Um, all of these issues combine in a case that, again, on its face, seems like a rather boring question of patent law doctrine. And so, as I said, there's been a lot of commentary about the case. In the popular media, there was coverage of the case, but, you know, that's always incomplete um, and, uh, you know, a very short snippets. There are court documents, of course, which are publicly accessible in the United States, but who's going to read those, right? They're practically inaccessible. And then there's the legal literature, the law review articles, to which I and Martin and many of the rest of us contribute to, and I hate to tell you this, guys, but like not that many people read our articles. Um, so it's opaque and, oops, it's opaque. It's also to some degree, uh, you know, less relevant. So I asked myself, given the importance of this case and what it was about, is there a way to tell this story in a manner that is accessible to a general audience? And there is an entire genre I discovered of books about not criminal cases, because you know the criminal law by now has been popularized to such a degree through CSI and Law and Order and all the other. Like, pretty much everyone on the planet knows about you know getting your rights read to you and a search warrant for arrest and all of these things. So civil cases are a bit different, yet there is still a literature about civil cases. And the, the, the book here in the upper left-hand corner, Civil Action, that really was my inspiration for this book. This is a book written in the 1990s uh, by an author named Jonathan Haar about a toxic contamination in, in a town in Massachusetts, which happens to be where I went to school, where I worked for most of my career uh, in, in Boston, not in this town, Woburn. And my law firm was involved in this case. In fact, we, of course, represented the big giant company that denied responsibility and uh, contaminated this water and actually won the case, by the way. So we did our job for our client. Um, nevertheless, you know, it was not a happy ending. Um, but our firm was involved and, and some of us got involved in reviewing not only the book, but, but the script for the Hollywood movie that came out about this case, right? So John Travolta played the scrappy plaintiff's lawyer. Robert Duvall played my partner, Jerry Fasher, um, the evil big corporate lawyer. And, and this got me thinking, you know, years ago that, you know, there's interesting stories to be told about civil cases. And so the result of that was this book, The Genome Defense, which is about association for molecular pathology versus myriad genetics. Um, you know, I won't give spoilers. Uh, you know, Martin has told you something about the case, and there are three uh, distinguished commentators will tell you more, possibly, or maybe not, about the book itself. I just want to, um, to sort of plug the idea of this sort of contemporary legal history for you. So the case occurs largely during the 2000s up into 2013, which is when the Supreme Court renders its decision. I, as hard as it is for me to believe, that's a decade ago now. So we have entered the realm of history as opposed to current events. But the dialogue continues, the fight continues in this area. Um, the decision, as I'm sure you will hear, has been criticized since the day it was handed down, basically because not enough patents are being issued as a result of this decision. And you can decide for yourself whether or not you agree with that, but certainly some US senators have agreed with that sentiment. And over the years, uh, repeatedly, a legislation, draft legislation has been introduced in the US Congress to do a few things, specifically to overturn the holding of the Supreme Court in this case. There's a bill uh, right now um, in the Senate Judiciary Committee called the Patent Eligibility Restoration Act, which would uh, reverse the decision in this case. Um, which does have implications both for newly discovered human genetic variants. Uh, once we discover the magic uh, variant that uh, gives COVID immunity, you know, that can't be patented today. Although if legislation like this passes, maybe it will be. There's also the issue of pathogens and microorganisms, uh, which are being newly generated. And uh, perhaps our speakers will uh, talk about these sorts of things. Those Organisms, viruses used to be patented, uh, H5N1, SARS, MERS were all patented back in the day, but um, 
SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for COVID-19, was not patented when it was sequenced um, at the end of 2019 and early 2020. I think in large part because norms had shifted over the last decade such that naturally occurring genetic sequences were no longer being patented. So where this goes next, we don't know. Uh, there, you know, it's a, an area that's in motion, um, but this I think illustrates that these types of issues in these cases are still live ones. Uh, they're still before the legislatures and the courts. And so if you're interested in these issues, um, you know, don't view this so much as a work of history um, as a work of uh, contemporary policy that informs things that are happening today. So that's really all I have to say in general. I, I, I also want to emphasize, you know, I, I did write this book, uh, but it is a book based largely on interviews and uh, ground research that I did. I interviewed almost 100 people for this book from lawyers at the ACLU, but also the law firms in-house at the companies. Uh, I interviewed doctors, uh, scientists, uh, genetic counselors, and the patients who were involved in this case. Um, it is really their story. I'm just the messenger. Uh, and uh, you know, if you enjoy the book, I, I hope you do, but I also uh, want to recognize their contribution. This is a book, it's about cancer also, which is a very sad and devastating disease. Uh, many of these people, or not many, some of these people are no longer with us uh, precisely because we're really talking about life and death issues here. Um, as a result of all of this and all the help that I got writing this book, I, I am donating half of my not huge proceeds from this book um, to the support group for BRCA positive um, individuals. If you are diagnosed with one of these genetic mutations, that's a pretty terrible piece of news. And there is a support group um, that has been incredibly helpful for these BRCA uh, positive people. Um, Pre-vivors, they call themselves, right? People who uh, have not yet been diagnosed with the disease, but have a very high likelihood that they will get it, which involves an entirely different set of psychological and, and medical issues than people who actually do have cancer, um, which of course they also deal with. So that is what I have to say. Um, and I will turn it back over to our host here. Thank you very much, George. Absolutely. Excellent. So. Let me just quickly introduce our three speakers, and then um, uh, we'll sit with them and, and hand uh, over the microphone one by one. First, I'd like to introduce um, them all. So first of all, we have uh, Jenny Molloy, who is a senior researcher um, at the University of Cambridge. Um, then we have Professor Duncan Matthews, who is professor of intellectual property at the Queen Mary University. Um, and then we have um, Daniel Alexander, who is a barrister at the uh, Eight uh, New Square here in London. And these three speakers have all very different expertise, which uh, hopefully make for, will make for a very interesting discussion. And I think we probably start with some science, George, what do you say? Um, so I think we'll ask Jenny uh, to start first because, uh, of course, lawyers will twist uh, everything around and uh, we need something, uh, something proper to start with. So Jenny, can you, can you help us there? Thank you. I've had an interest in patent law and particularly um, access to technologies and how that influences scientific innovation. So I've come across George in a couple of capacities and was very honoured that he invited me down to London to talk to you. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that as, as a scientist, so I, I um, trained as a biologist in the period 2007 to 2015 was when I was undertaking my undergraduate and postgraduate studies. So this is the height of <laughs> a lot of the legal battles that were going on. And as someone who specialised in evolutionary genetics and genetics more generally, I, for, as a sort of from the scientific perspective, uh, found it very difficult to comprehend why, <laughs> you know, the, the, these isolated genes could be considered patentable. And at that time, I knew nothing really about patent law or any of the kind of nuances. But um, myself and my very, you know, opinionated undergraduate friends agreed that we couldn't really see why this was a thing at all. And so, um, but if you dig down through the book, there's there's some, you know, it's interesting how the kind of scientific arguments as to um, to what extent this DNA 
is a product of humans versus a product of nature. I mean, it, it is incredibly nuanced, and I was just struck by, um, in essence, the kind of the thread of collaboration throughout the entire book between the scientists and the lawyers in kind of really learning from each other and kind of delving down into these um, unexplored territories in some cases. Um, and so I just, I, there was a couple of kind of bouncing around. I mean, I, the, there was a collaboration between Chris Mason, who was a graduate student at the time, so I think also a great illustration of kind of people from a whole range of backgrounds, but also kind of career stages that got involved in this um, very extensive lawsuit. Um, and I, I have come across Chris in, in other circles. He, he remains a kind of a major proponent of interdisciplinary collaboration and led a major initiative during COVID around developing new diagnostic technologies. Um, but then to go from that to thinking about, you know, the scientists can kind of tell you why they think these patents should be struck down from a scientific perspective as to what is what is derived from um, humans, what uh, human ingenuity, what is derived from nature. But then knowing how to take on a political case is something totally different. And so it really struck me this kind of like interplay between a list of patents generated by scientists um, with very technical data and then the selection of which organization to go after which was incredibly driven not only by the legal side but also by the political side and I think if this kind of civil civil suit coming from ACLU put a real spin on this and the selection of the BRCA gene and of Myriad and the idea that there's a quote in the book from Chris Hansen talking about why they didn't go after long QT syndrome which from a sort of technical standpoint was as legitimate a target but he's saying nobody will know what it is in a kind of like just really thinking about the societal kind of implications um, and then kind of a little bit later when there were sort of arguments being put forward about the idea that DNA isolated DNA fragments could not exist in nature in isolation and that we as humans had kind of severed those bonds between the nucleotides and therefore made something that we couldn't find in nature having Eric Lander kind of working through the night to put forward and working with his colleagues to put, put forward 23 scientific citations as to why you absolutely can find isolated DNA. I just found that really fascinating, this kind of huge number of people coming together. Um, and so, so I, think, I think we still see a kind of a, a real, um, the, the aftermath that George kind of covers at the end of the book thinking about this constant interplay between balancing scientific discovery with these kind of corporate interests and rights for health as well. I think that was a really, um, a really interesting, having had the, the whole story, which you tell as a, very engagingly, but as a sort of observer almost, to have your thoughts at the end, I think was really, was really great. And I wanted to say, like, as, a, as someone who works a lot on, in the sort of genetic engineering field, um, I totally agree with what George just said at the end of his talk just now, that the, the idea that you can't patent these kind of this very specific set of genetic um, genetic sequences is is one thing, but we're progressively moving towards the point where you know it's it's incredibly easy to work around those restrictions. And genetic engineering technologies are coming on so much, um, and so it's so much easier than it was ten years ago to edit and engineer genomes. Um, and so I think that that's going to be a very interesting field where we kind of again hopefully see this interaction between the scientists and the and the lawyers and um, people the, the kind of stakeholders in the health sense. Um, the CRISPR debates were also brought up at the very end of the book, and that's something that you know has absolutely revolutionised things from a scientific perspective. And it definitely is another field where I kind of can see this sort of that that interplay happening. My PhD was on genetically engineering mosquitoes and we basically had to kind of throw some DNA in and hope that it stuck <laughs> in the genome where we wanted it to in a useful place. And now you really can go in and kind of use these molecular scissors to kind of to, to get in there. And, and how we use that technology and the access and equity angle, I think is still very much an ongoing debate. I was at a conference run by um, the Wellcome Trust last week where there was a lot of talk around CAR T therapies, these kind of cell therapies. Um, and interestingly enough, across the whole conference, it wasn't once raised the idea of kind of the, the accessibility of these incredibly expensive and customized treatments. And so I think the sort of the link between this and the personalized medicine field that's really now having amazing results in the clinic, but is also not only kind of very heavily um, you know, surrounded by intellectual property, but also on a patient by patient basis, the technical work has to be done individually. I think it's that's a sort of whole extra field that I can see some of these initial decisions um, will you know, have to be very much built upon to work through um, 
those access problems that might arise. Um, and so I think the, the final thing I wanted to say was, was really that I, I felt like it was an excellent merging of some of these challenges around um, the, the sort of civil rights area of access to scientific knowledge. And that plays out in a, a number of fields. And George and I worked um, on some initiatives during the COVID pandemic as well, thinking about the intellectual property and the boundaries of that and how this sort of social contract between the companies and the, the patent law and the accessibility to not only kind of in the US, which this book is very targeted at, uh, very targeted at but also around the world. Um, and I think some of that uh, really, these deeper issues kind of make it, really bring it home for people that are not patent lawyers. So I have to say, I really, I really enjoyed um, learning as well, more on the legal side. I, I feel like I'm reasonably well read for a biologist in terms of patent law, but there's still so much to do. And I think finally, that it's really important that um, we, we kind of have books like this and we have more um, communication you know, my, my peers are basically developing these technologies, but we're developing them in an environment where, although we don't have quite the same system as in the US, in the UK there really is, I think, minimal awareness um, of the different um, the implications of intellectual property for biotechnology. At least myself, I work in a biotechnology department where we run a whole master's program in bioscience enterprise, and the, the kind of exposure that people get to different options for intellectual property and motivations for why you would hold intellectual property and how you would deploy it uh, are quite, I would say, quite limited. So a lot of the intellectual property law that gets taught is very much around when and how and why you would file a patent in, I would say, a fairly kind of traditional sense of the biotech industry. Um, but it also struck me kind of looking through that list to go back to the kind of the scientific um, Support, support to put together these lists of patents that may be um, targets for, um, for for litigation, but some of those were entirely open access. Some of those genes that were discovered, there was there was a range of, of kind of um, strategies there, and I just hope that you know that continues to to be taught <laughs> to the next generation mm -hmm. of biotechnologists as well, so that we see kind of how you can use, how you can consider intellectual property, not in just a kind of binary patent or no patent, but how you can kind of be a bit more nuanced about it. And I think this book will be, um, I'll definitely recommend it to my students, so, <laughs> so that's a, a good, um, but I think, I think it's a really good one to just kind of give the whole picture of, of all of these interfaces with the science, with the law, with the policy. So thank you, George. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jenny. Um, shall we continue with you, Duncan? Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, well, Martin, you began by talking about Jedi's. Yeah. <laughs> I was also impressed to see a reference early in the book to a film which is very close to my heart, Meet the Planet of the Apes from 1970. Oh. <laughs> so these examples just show how uh, accessible the book is. Really, <laughs> if you're of a certain demographic. In the nature, you know. um, but um, uh, it's a wonderful book. And I just picked out some things which I particularly enjoyed about the book. Um, and I'm going to start with the concept of what do we mean in patent law when we talk about a product of nature. Um, early in the book, George very eloquently describes how Judge Leonard Hand's 1910 ruling in Park Davis um, set out that there's no such rule about products of nature being non-patentable subject matter. And George explains why that was probably a mistaken uh, ruling in 1910. Um, and the consequences of that he then shows right up to Chakrabarti in uh, 1980, that everything under the sun known to man is available for patenting, right through to Myriad's um, naturally occurring versus synthetic distinction. Um, and the book really shows that both the judiciary and the legislature have really struggled with this concept of what is nature and what is a product of nature uh, throughout the history of, of modern patent law. Um, and this contestation about what do we mean in patent law when we talk about nature would have been well known to one of the key characters in the book when she started working on this uh, Myriad case, and I'm thinking about um, Tania Simoncelli. Yeah? 
uh, because, um, as George explains in the book, she later became the science advisor at the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, but earlier in her career, she was a research assistant of Professor Sheila Jasnov, who's at the um, Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and of course, it was Sheila Jasnov who, uh, as the book correctly says, was a key uh, figure in the emerging field of science and technology studies. And it was really science and technology studies which grappled with this concept of what do we mean in law when we talk about nature. So, so this thing comes out very strongly in the book and I found that really helpful as, as background for the discussion. Um, we, we then in, introduced to another sort of overlapping area of, of, of uh, patent law um, because um, George then explains how um, Chris Hansen's, one of his first interactions with patent law was not the Myriad case, but was the Bilski decision at the Court of Appeals Federal Circuit. And the book explains how Chris Hansen, who of course you'll know is the, uh, or was the, is he still there? Is he still at the? He, he's retired, he's still, living. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, still living, yeah, yeah. So he was the uh, National League st staff lead on the, the Myriad case, but way before that, he was um, very much attracted by the dissenting uh, decision uh, or the sending comment in the Court of Appeals um, Bilski decision, uh, which um, uh, this was Judge Mayer's uh, dissent, where he referred to the fact that um, patents on methods of conducting business can raise considerable First Amendment concerns by imposing broad restrictions on speech and the flow of ideas. So I found that um, these things that I never knew about, that, you know, that actually the, the seeds of, of looking at patent law in the ACLU's uh, team came much, much earlier. So I, so I found that first section of the book really great. We're then introduced to the work that um, Dan Ravitcher, is that how you pronounce it? Ravitcher. Yeah. Ravitcher, yeah. Um, did with the Public Patent Foundation, PubPat. Um, enabling the public to access the patent system in order to prevent unsound patent policies and provide the public with representative representation, education, and advocacy. So that was kind of circa 2003, I think, around that time, a bit, a bit earlier, maybe. Um, and I think that, you know, and that was also uh, for me as a non US uh, uh, studier of, of, of patent law, how the, the kind of um, uh, civil society aspects of interaction with the patent system sort of came to a fore in that period when, of course, we had the debate about the Delphi Declaration of Trips, um, an increasing realization about the relationship between uh, traditional knowledge and uh, the impact this would have on indigenous people, etc. So I think this is, this, was a, this is another aspect of civil society's engagement with these types of problems. Um, and um, we're then told by George why uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 were chosen, as Jenny said, over long QT syndrome, that actually to have the resonance of a, a, a cancer which will affect one in eight women living in the United States, um, showed the resonance that this would have. And I think particularly in, in, a, in a jury based system, uh, which always seems weird to me that you have jury trials from that one, but um, but I think the resonance of of, of the um, of the myriad um, um, suit was is you know shows that to the full. We're then told again about the role of coalition building, something that Jenny also just mentioned, um, and the involvement of the ACLU's uh, Women's Rights Project. Um, and later in the book, we see concerns that disadvantaged and minority groups in society who are being excluded from the myriad uh, testing program. So I think all these themes about coalition building and civil society, I really enjoyed. And we're told about the economics of the healthcare system in the United States, which again is completely uh, alien to, to somebody living in the UK, um, and the risks of health discrimination on the basis of one's um, genes. Um, and we, we were told about the, um, uh, the, the GINA, the, 
Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, which I didn't know about. Um, and the book then takes us through some of the unintended consequences of GINA for testing under the Myriad regime. So um, for, for a non-US follower of, of these issues, this, is, this was all great stuff. Um, we're, we're then told like in very accessible terms about the science behind the, um, the Myriad patents. Um, and I particularly like the way that you describe that it would be like a spell checker, maybe in a Word document. And instead of trying to detect a spell check word, the spell checker would be looking for whole paragraphs which had been de deleted or switched around. And this would be the BRCA1 um, uh, gene, for example. Um, so it's so accessible for, uh, to read. Um, coming back to the kind of the health economics of this, we're then told about um, you know, the fact that Myriad had an extra test, which was this um, BART test, which only cost another $700, but because of the kind of health economics and insurance systems in the US, um, it wasn't available. Even if you wanted to pay for this uh, privately, the $700 um, additional test wasn't, uh, wasn't available. Um, and there's some nice comparisons with other technologies that you know, if you want to uh, upgrade, I think you used even the super size example here, yeah? um, and that this just wasn't available um, for, for the reasons that George explains. Um, we'll talk about how um, health practitioners and health ethicists were concerned about um, the unintended consequences of a positive test result, that uh, women might have unnecessary surgery, um, or might uh, suffer from undue anxiety or, or, or mental health risks as a result of having a test. So the logic of, of the test being you know, the gold standard, the thing to aim for, wasn't entirely shared throughout the, uh, the medical um, community. And then coming back to the, the, the patent um, relationship uh, with, the, with the Myriad um, well, the seven, the seven patterns that Myriad had. Um, I like the fact that uh, Chris Hansen, when he first got hold of the files for the patterns, he was shocked as a non patent lawyer to see that um, it gave Myriad the rights to a strand of <coughs> DNA anywhere in the human body that shared a sequence of just 15 base pairs with the BRAC genes. So, to non patent lawyers, they, in terms of scope of claims, they were really shocked by what actually was, was being granted patents in the United States. Um, so as a, as a postscript to that first section of the book, and then I'm gonna to jump to, to some of the conclusions and finish off. Um, when, I was reading, when I was reading this, all new information to me, and it made me think of some work that I was doing around the same time, around 2003 to 2004, with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. And in 2004, AAAS set up a special program on science, intellectual property, and the public interest. Um, it was led by a professor called uh, Audrey, Audrey Chapman, um, you, you might remember. And um, it was concerned with the privatization of public science. And I think a lot of the messages which are coming out of the book are about the privatization of Effectively, public science. So, you know, a lot, a lot of the science is coming from universities and the public sector, and it's pu publicly funded. Um, the AAAS uh, project that I was working on in 2004 ultimately failed because it was looking for um, voluntary participation from private companies uh, in the biosciences field to voluntarily share on a royalty-free basis, these inventions. And then, of course, what was happening at the same time is this, this was parallel uh, issue emerging with uh, Myriad. So um, I think that shows kind of the failures of the, um, uh, the voluntary system um, um, running parallel to this, um, this case. So um, just j jumping to, uh, to some of the, the things that I like to the end of the book. Um, I don't want to give the game away, but uh, what I like is that uh, George comes down very firmly and says what he thinks about the Supreme Court decision. Um, so he doesn't sit on the fence. He really, he really goes for it uh, at the end of the book. Um, and as I said in my earlier remarks, the book's also, you know, it has 
this dimension of talking about how people can form coalitions, they can communicate science in an understandable way, and when they do that, um, they can achieve great things. And in the end, ultimately, as George said, when he showed us the photos of those people involved, it's really a book about people. Um, it's not really about law, it's about people. Um, and that's what I loved about the book. Um, so I'll commend the book to you on that basis. So thank you again, George, for writing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, thank you. I don't want to hear. Thank you for inviting me again. I'm, I'm here in the LSE second time this week. We, <laughs> we tried this experimental course actually yesterday. So you're so, still at home here. I feel very at home here. <laughs> Touching from actually some of the fundamental themes that the book touches on, namely circumstances in which rights are granted in relation to things that some people think should be part of the public domain, mm -hmm. which is a fundamental issue uh, in this whole uh, territory. So uh, I, I thought it was a, a great book, um, and I just wanted to give a few thoughts from a kind of litigator's perspective, if that's uh, uh, convenient. Before, before doing that, it, there's another reason why it's particularly appropriate to be launching in the LSE, and that's Bill Cornish. So Bill Cornish was really the founder of the uh, discipline, the coherent discipline of intellectual property teaching in England uh, at the LSE in the 1960s and 70s when it wasn't really done. Um, I wouldn't say he was exactly an intellectual property skeptic or cynic, but he was like, he was quite critical of a lot of the stuff that was done. But, and the other thing that he was very interested in was legal history and the importance of legal history and looking really under the skin of why particular doctrines developed in, in the 18th century, 19th century, and so on. He wrote very extensively on that. So the intersection of what might be called IP and, in this case, contemporary legal history is actually here <laughs> in a sort of odd way. So it's very good that you are here launching this here, which continues this uh, uh, um, very important uh, tradition. So um, from a kind of litigator's perspective, why, why is it important? Well, first of all, it tells a great story, and we all know that narrative is the only thing that counts. Well, there's one other thing that counts. I'll come back to that in the litigation. <laughs> um, yeah, well, perhaps two, three, <laughs> let's see. Um, it's kind of gripping. It's got a thriller-like uh, quality. People have mentioned some of the other authors. Michael Crichton actually features uh, as a, not just a bit player, I mean, he's like a real player in this as a, 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 a character actually influencing the bit, as does Angelina Jolie. You think, now, wait a minute, Angelina Jolie in a patent law book, that is an absolutely <laughs> cracking combination. So it's an illustration. That. That's an illustration. I'm trying to think it's on my cases now. How can I? Uh, <laughs> really, really attractive actors and actresses. That's not to make the point. That was, a, that was a fantastic one. Um, so, I mean, it's important because it deals with what can be made the subject of property. And, and one of the things that you do is you quote, of course, the old Douglas, uh, Judge Douglas uh, quotation about patents can't issue the discovery of phenomena of nature, like the heat of the sun, electricity, or the qualities of metal. They're part of the storehouse of knowledge of all men, as he said. But it's, 1948, manifestations of the law of nature, free to all and reserved exclusively to none. Now that's a kind of sentiment that, following your thinking, would be a kind of scientist sentiment. Although I always think that uh, it's like a little bit like you know, everyone is an atheist until they're facing the point of a gun. Mm -hmm. Every scientist is an IP skeptic until they speak to the technology transfer officer. <laughs> <laughs> and the royalties they can get in, they manage to yeah, yeah. Whoa, at that point, suddenly they think, wait a minute, I've become an enthusiast for this. Why the hell? And people like the ACLU kind of knocking me on my butt. So we see in the book some of the role of academics, because there's a lot of academic in, in institutions that are responsible for patenting. Uh, and uh, I was amused to the discussion of Laura Caruzzi, who was one of the, in fact, she's, there, there are sort of hidden, uh, which are not so hidden, but, but players in the, in the game who are kind of really the heroes, or in some respects the heroines. So Laura Caruzzi is an absolutely fantastic scientist. She was the, in a sense, second chair, or sort of junior in the uh, litigation, AKA leading the whole thing. I mean, I, I have worked with her on cases of actually four universities, and I'm quite confident that, uh, who, I can't remember the name of the lead counsel. Castanius. Castanius. He would not have made a move or opened his mouth without doing what Laura told him. <laughs> so she's kind of comes, comes through that, and you're nodding suggests that I haven't quite got that wrong. So you talk about the genre of 
this kind of uh, what might be called case biography, mm -hmm. which I think is actually a very important one. And, and you are in a, a city where that is done. You may know Philippe Sands from mm -hmm. UCL, who is actually a professor of the public understanding of law. I think, okay, that's what they said. Now, this is what you are doing. And he has written not in the same area of civil actions, but criminal liability, no, about NERMAC trials, but also in relation to the public international law of um, uh, uh, rights to claim colonial territories, Chagos Islands and so forth, and the International Court of Justice claims there. Uh, again, uh, very important for bringing this to public view as to what's going on to see how this the legislation is made. And I think that's another important aspect of uh, th this book, which is the public view part. And uh, it's particularly interesting to do it with patents, because one might say, well, this is a kind of obscure, nerdy area. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is not something which is naturally going to grip the imagination. But I think it's particularly important, and you do it very well, to do it for those areas, because they have this extraordinary impact. But if you say, well, look, this is not about patents. This is about whether people can charge $3,000 rather than whatever it is, $199 mm -hmm. for, a, for a test. In the case of uh, quite a lot of the modern um, tests and indeed therapies, $3,000, my God, you're getting, you're lucky if you get away with that. That is like unbelievably cheap compared with, with, with one of these. So these issues of uh, the creation of entitlements, which are not just the creation of entitlements, they're also the destruction of other people's entitlements, because of course, one of the things that people think about in patents is we're creating property rights. We say, yeah, you, you are, and thereby you are destroying mm -hmm. my property rights quite often in relation to the fact that I'm out to pay more and so forth. So if you think about the kind of the, the, these things as being claims which are made in, in that respect, it kind of grips the public imagination rather more, and I think you do that very well and weave those, those issues uh, in, including the insurance context and so forth. Uh, at, at some point, you're going to have to write a book. This is actually a higher challenge on the uh, dynamics of the US insurance, uh, healthcare insurance industry. I'm not quite sure you could identify a case directly on that, but in fact, it is unbelievably important. Uh, for this kind of thing to be brought to public view. So I think you've done a great job uh, on all of that. Uh, a few points just on the kind of litigation point, lit litigation uh, uh, approach. So uh, uh, it, it is, of course, very interesting that this was a case brought by a civil rights group. And we have had some of that kind of thing in, in Europe. So the first case I ever did in the European Patent Office uh, was for Greenpeace, which was trying to get environmental law uh, embedded into the European patent system. It wasn't very successful, I can see you you're looking at it. But it was, a, it was a plant genetic system. So what we were trying to do uh, was challenge uh, the patent for essentially um, uh, herbicide-resistant plants, so glyphosate-resistant uh, plants. So it was the Lehman's patent, which is a very uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, patent, a very interesting case, and we were trying to do an article uh, um, uh, 53A, which is the morality uh, question, trying to put environmental law to morality, and also on a kind of part of nature, it's slightly more complicated than that in, in European law, because it's the boundary between um, plant protection and uh, 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 patents. And so we went along to the European Patent Office, and of course the Patent Office hadn't really seen this idea that people outside this quite narrow community of patent attorneys were, and sort of large companies, were actually putting not just individual patents, but in some sense the whole system under scrutiny. Uh, and uh, so they kind of looked rather askance, you know, who are these? You know, how on earth do you have the entitlement even to come along and question what the hell we are doing? I found actually there was an even more uh, amusing example of this, where a, a Munich school decided that for their science project, they would make an application to revoke one of the main <laughs> 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 
And they will tell you a part of the position is you can follow a position without standing. And then it is they, they, they turned off and made the uh, application. I was told that the application was successful. I mean, they won the case. In fact, it was really funny. You can imagine them in the, in the closet saying, oh, it was quite a successful science project. But the, 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 this issue, you know, the reason I think it's important is because people think of patent law as being something that's a kind of specialist subject. It's a kind of the ultimate technocracy. And what this book is about is the demo democratization of technocracy uh, in a very fundamental uh, way. And so I rather liked th that th and uh, the way that you brought that to light and what they were doing uh, on, that, on that front. So a couple of other things just on the litigation strategy and the, what you need to do to choose your tribunal. I, I love all of that. So, so one of the other kind of my heroines from the uh, case um, was the uh, dissenting, uh, sorry, the assenting judge in the Federal Circuit, who is now the, I think, chief judge of the uh, Federal Circuit, who wrote, who, she's an interesting engineering background. Yes. Um, and, but nonetheless, I think probably wrote the best <laughs> of the summary introductory decisions. Because Lurie and who was it? It was the uh, the other guy who was the ex, was he an ex journalist? His name I can't remember. Uh, the a judge who was in favour of revoking the patent in the federal circuit. Um, Bry is it Bryson? Yes, Bryson. Yes, Bryson. Yes, Bryson. Um, anyway, so she wrote this great decision mm -hmm. both uh, the first time round, and she was wavering the second mm -hmm. time round. I sort of had this uh, uh, feeling. Um, and it, one of the interesting things I found about that was that the level of analysis there that was brought to bear by the different judges, including the first instance judge, where he wrote, what, 150 page opinion? Yes. Well, it was really a very long, very detailed, very careful mm -hmm. uh, opinion, was not, I'm afraid, matched by SCOTUS. <laughs> now, as you will probably gather, I'm not one of the biggest fans of Clarence Thomas. Uh, and in, well, you may say his patent decision is not the very worst of, the, uh, of what he gets. You're, you're lucky to be the only one to lose on, on patents because you can't really do too much damage there. And probably Briar writes the memorial. So, uh, but, yeah, shocking, actually. 18 pages of, hmm, I guess we'll just do what the. Uh, uh, use of the attorney of the Solicitor General mm -hmm. basically says, and we'll make this distinction, it's a little bit artificial, I think you would say, between DNA and cDNA. I think, guys, in the context of basically an information uh, uh, patent, and in circumstances where, as you, you, you've observed, you, get, you can get around, in theory, I try to get around the whole thing by saying, okay, well, let's forget about all this DNA stuff. We'll just do primers, mm -hmm. yeah? which was actually a technique used also by Chiron in the European Patent Office, when the European Patent Office said, actually, you can't have any patents that are far too broad. You know? They said, okay, 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 let's just give us primers. And uh, they, that was ultimately up upheld. Um, so I thought, actually, you need to do a better job if you're the Supreme Court. So that's my kind of view of the tribunal. Very interesting discussion of the approach to advocacy, what you need to do to marshal your arguments. And also, I thought, a very interesting a uh, discussion of the left field. The left field was the learner, is it the learner? Or, uh, the, the scientist, Breyer's neighbor. Lander. Lander. Okay, so this book could be subtitled, in my, in my view, the, the Lander Brief. <laughs> Why? So Lander was the kind of scientist who was, I don't know whether he was a mate of, but he was a neighbor of Briars of the Harvard. They all lived on Brattle they all, Street. They all lived on whichever street you were Yeah. <laughs> which which Brattle? Brattle Street. They li oh, he was a Brattle Street. OK, well, that, not, not surprising. Next to Harvard. Next to Harvard, Brattle. <laughs> Brattle Street is one of the great streets in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah, fantastic houses. So if you're Briar, you say, well, actually, any guy lives on, on Brattle Street. I'll like, okay. <laughs> throw all of these other briefs out of the window. I just, just give me the ones. <laughs> Yeah, well, you looked at that. So wait a minute. This this all makes sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, essentially, the, the judges were sort of torturing mm -hmm. and the poor counsel from Marriott, who probably hadn't paid attention, he hadn't even looked up the address. That uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he came over and said, "My God, if I looked up the address, I would have prepared properly to answer that uh, uh, that uh, point." And it kind of put in mind 
um, one of my uh, total disasters of advocacy in the Supreme Court uh, in this country, where I had uh, forgotten to rem to that the main judge, which is the head of the court, was actually had actually written a decision at first instance some years, previous years ago that he was wanting to have restored once he got to the Supreme Court, which the previous judge, Trevor is nodding, uh, <laughs> laughing at me as he's doing it, previous judge, uh, in this case Lord Hoffman, had overruled. And so this was like revenge served very, very cold. And I, damn, as I was up there, I, I just have not adequately, I've not adequately prepared. I mean, it's quite actually a hard gig. To, to explain why it was you were wrong then, <laughs> and still would be wrong if you did the same thing, but I didn't. I didn't do it, and I might have had a chance if I had. I went to dinner with him later on, and made various arguments in relation to it with my opponent on that case, and he said, well, "If you'd argued that way, you might have won." <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a kind of reminder of like, these sort of left field. Issues of how one should do uh, advocacy in this context. And the final point I just wanted to uh, uh, make is uh, looking forward, as you've got this, what happened uh, afterwards. And it, one of the striking things that, uh, well, as a kind of slightly cynical litigator, I've always noticed, is how kind of little difference in some respects of work. Makes. So what happened with the Myriad case? Myriad, they uh, uh, have this decision that knocks out the patent, but it kind of remains in force for a while, and it goes up to the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit has this decision which is divided. The Supreme Court says, I vacate and remand. Okay, so decision is vacated. Remanded, and the Federal Circuit sets a hearing. So that's how many months go by. I can't tell how many months ago that was reheard. Uh, up to that point, I think you quote the figure of how much Myriad made is $250 million. Okay, was made out of a patent that was actually invalid, okay, which will never come back because there was no uh, possibility of recourse from these people who paid their, uh, paid their money over. And so after the, the patent was invalidated, they, just, they tried this gambit with the, with the um, uh, uh, primers. And that gambit didn't work either. And surprisingly, in a way, because it was Utah, Utah first instance judge, home territory. And I think it's very interesting because you're obviously working in Utah. You're, you're uh, kind of shooting the local, uh, local <laughs> business. Um, but the judges were not having that either. Yeah? And they gave up. But today, Myriad, I think, is still in pole position on, on uh, these tests. They've got a whole raft of other IP rights. They kind of don't need them anymore because they've, they, they've they got the leg up that they needed to get to get up. It's true that the price has gone down on their competing products, but they are way ahead. So you can have this situation where, after all of this time, yeah, all of this effort from the most extraordinary scientists and lawyers and so forth. Well, actually, it affected our. It didn't affect our share price. You know, the EBITDA it kind of stayed the same uh, throughout. And so that's one of the very, very interesting things I found about the kind of real economics of this industry. If you can find that you are uh, in an unbelievably good position from what may be described as the arguable case. Where all you need is an arguable case, and that is worth a hell of a lot of money. And so, anyway, I commend you for having written it. It's a great book for teaching how to do litigation strategy, what you need to do, at least in the United States context. And I loved your extra materials that I checked out on your website where you've got questions, mm -hmm. it's like, each of the three sections on the first instance decision, the Court of the Federal Circuit uh, decision, and the Supreme Court decision could be in individual classes, I think, on 
how to do trial uh, preparation, getting together things on standing, um, uh, federal court advocacy, yeah, and Supreme Court analysis, including all the stuff that they did on mooting the cases. I thought it was very interesting that you got through that, that did that. And one of your strengths that you're able to bring to it is you look at it from an academic perspective. So you're not looking at it as a lawyer or someone who's got an interest in the case, which gave you the kind of journalist's mm -hmm. insight into both sides of the uh, preparing uh, team. And so uh, my hat goes off to you for the work you've done. Thanks so much, Alan. This was fantastic. Excellent. Would you like to react to anything, or shall we open the floor to questions right away? Yeah, my, my reaction is simply thank you all so much for uh, for, for your comments. Um, you know, I you start out on a project like this, which is totally unlike any of the other books I've edited or written. Um, the the book that came out immediately before this of mine was Utah Real Property Law. You know, definitive <laughs> <laughs> treatise. <laughs> so, which I'm, uh, has been around since the 70s, uh, and I've, uh, I'm the current editor. But uh, yeah, this is a totally different type of writing, and I, I felt that uh, I wanted more people to read it than read Utah Real Property Law <laughs> or any of the other things. And, and I, I really hope it does get to a broader audience, and, and uh, uh, because I do think they're important issues. And, uh, and thank you. So I, I do teach it. I, I, I do have a seminar um, where I have. I think I shared with Duncan my hundred discussion questions in all different categories, um, and uh, it, it I did try to pack in a lot of legal lessons. You know, I was thinking about teaching as I was writing it. Of course, I'm a teacher um, at heart, so yeah. So, so thank you. Excellent. So let's uh, open up the questions. Oh. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, George. Uh, take the mic just yeah, for the yeah. uh, recording. For the recording. Thanks very much uh, for writing this, George. I must admit to not having read it yet, but I promise <laughs> that I will do so. Um, I did you know, obviously follow the US litigation and indeed uh, recall a, a, a Fordham conference where I was uh, sat next to Dan Ravisher and we were both presenting our respective legal frameworks. And uh, I felt I got the better of that, but perhaps not. I don't know. It didn't, didn't work out that way. But um, going to the issue of the public understanding of law, um, yours naturally, because this was US litigation, is, I assume, a purely US perspective on this. I, there's an international aspect to this too, but the book I, I already had to cut you know, like 75 pages mm -hmm. from the manuscript for the so yeah. I could not go into the book. No, because it, the trouble with the public understanding of law, it seems to me, based on this US analysis, is that the situation is rather different in Europe. There is no absolute ban on patenting products of nature. There is a much wider research defense. Um, and for example, reading the, uh, the sort of subtitle of your book, the battle to determine who owns your DNA, I'm reminded of some very strident comments from uh, I think it was an opposition division in the European Patent Office, which said just because somebody has a patent on your DNA doesn't mean you, they own your DNA. And so I'm wondering how one conveys these, the subtleties inherent in legal analysis in these sort of areas, the difference between different legal systems and this sort of concept of you know, what really is ownership and things like that. I, I mean, it, it, it must be an impossible task in a book like this, but I'm just wondering how generally we, we do something about that. Yes, well, I, so I will admit up front that this book is about a US case, and, and it 
covers the US law. I mentioned in the introduction, I think, that yes, there is a case in Australia. Um, there are cases in, well, <laughs> for better or worse. There is an Australian case. There were challenges in, in Europe, in Canada. Uh, there was uh, stuff that happened. And, and I just couldn't, I couldn't cover it all in, in the book. And so it's a US story. But I mean, and I'll come to the doctrine in, in a second. But uh, to some extent, I, the, the legal doctrine itself, I, I found less important, right? I mean, I think the interest in the book is to some degree showing how the common law is made, right? And so this is totally, this is not a civil law system in which you bureaucrats will, you know, make up, you know, and put it in the code and so forth. The, the policy making through litigation is a very distinctly common law uh, phenomenon. And even living in the United States, I'd say most ordinary people in the United States Imagine that we live in a civil law system, right? That 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 so things like the tax code and the traffic code; those are codified law, um, just like you would have in France or Germany. Um, and, and they don't appreciate what the common law is and and how it works. And that judges, these individual judges, juries, that they didn't know whether this would go to a jury at the beginning. Um, they thought it might, and so part of their preparation was for a jury trial. Eventually, it was a, like a summary judgment motion that carried the day at the district court. So there, there was not a jury trial, but they had prepped it as though it was going to go to a jury. Um, I think most Americans probably don't understand this either. So, so I think there's some basic educational goals in, in the book for an American populace, uh, let alone a European uh, populace. Um, I think there's enough misunderstanding even among Americans of their own legal system, but I also wanted to show that the common law system is an extremely powerful system, that change can be affected by a group of outsiders. I mean, one of the points I, I tried to make in the book is that the ACLU it had been around for a century, right? Literally 100 years, never brought a patent case. There were no patent qualified lawyers at the ACLU. It was questionable whether any of them had ever taken a patent class when they started to consider this case. Eventually, someone, Sandra Park, came along and she had uh, been a pre-made new something. But by and large, they didn't know anything about it. They were complete outsiders. Chris Hansen, this main character, had an intuitive reaction, sort of a visceral intuitive reaction to the concept that you can patent human genes. And, and initially, he probably you know, got it wrong. You know, his intuitive reaction was a reaction to something that wasn't actually happening. No one was patenting the genes inside of your body, right? Which is often a mistake that the press would make. And, and I did also want to sort of clear the air of those mistakes that, again, the popular press had, had made. Um, because it does seem outrageous. And if someone could own the DNA inside of your body, I'll just say as a footnote, the, the, the title of the book, the, the publisher came up with the title. Um, <laughs> and and there were many worse titles. I can assure you. So don't don't don't. Can like you that. give us the worst? Yes, the the people versus big pharma was the worst of them all because a big pharma is not involved in this book. <laughs> B it's not a criminal law case. <laughs> people are involved in it. So so like completely off base by marketing people who clearly have not even read my one paragraph description of the book. Today. Anyway, I, the publisher was great in many many ways, but um, we had a big fight about the title. In any case, um, now I've I've lost the, uh, the, the train of thought. This actual question. <laughs> Excellent. So do we have further questions from the audience? Um, if not, I can turn. Yeah, Luke. Uh, many thanks to, to the panel. I mean, uh, honestly, this is one of the, the most interesting events that I've been to in a long time. So I just want to commend everybody for having a really interesting perspective. Everyone said something different, and everyone said something really interesting, which is not always the case. So thank you. Um, and I, you know, one of the things that I think has been so great about this event is that it has actually made me think differently about the case and also the value of the book. Because drawing on what everybody has said, it seems to me that in, a, in an odd way, this 
case and this book sums up the end of an era, um, you know, as you've all alluded to, the science and the innovation and the industry of where we're going now is towards personalized medicine. And so patents on, you know, single patents on single drugs that could be blockbusters may be less of a thing of the past. Um, challenging specific patents on even specific processes may not be, you know, as, as, as Daniel said, you end up in a situation where there's so many other layers of the IP system that are in effect that getting to that point where you have a head start like Myriad did, where you build up the expertise and the ecosystem and the tacit knowledge, um, you know, you, you get to the stage where, a bit like with the EpiPen, where even though the underlying ingredients are generic, the, the brand, the, the head start ma makes you the market leader for, for a long, long time. And that combined then with the issue of personalized medicine, which brings up the issue that several people alluded to, which is that we're insulated from a lot of these access problems in Europe because we have at least partially socialized healthcare. And so it is in the United States where a lot of these battles are first fought because people are at the front line of not being able to get access even to relatively straightforward healthcare and, and medicines. So wherever we're going, these battles are likely to be fought first in the US. Um, there is a lot of interesting stuff going on right now in the NHS, however. I mean, the NHS has just this last year been doing the first personalized medicine for, for certain conditions. It's costing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds per patient, but they're doing it. Um, there's a huge battle going on right now between, this is where Big Pharma does come in, between the, the, the medicines pricing agreement that the NHS has. And, um, you know, several companies, including Pfizer, pulled out of that. So there's a huge battle coming for um, us on this side of the pond of how we are going, first of all, are we going to be able to sustain a, um, a socialized medical system when that is combined with a personalized medical system where bulk buying of generics will not necessarily save you the amount of money that it currently does save the NHS. But at the same time, the NHS will still be what it is now, uh, as presuming it survives for some time, which is a single purchaser of drugs. So it's able to drive down prices through that. But will it be able to do that for personalized medicine? It, that, that remains to be seen. So um, I was wondering whether, you, whether, whether anyone on the panel had any further thoughts about that issue of, of personalized medicine, where we're going. As said, some of you have already touched upon it. Um, so I don't have a question beyond that. I just really wanted to, to, to commend you on, on the, um, the, the, the level of the discussion um, because, I, I, as you all said, patent law is not easy to get to the heart of the matter. It is a very technical subject, but I think everyone did a fantastic job in that regard. Excellent. Thank you, Luke. So we open it to the entire panel now. was very much the science that was coming out of the initial human genome project. So this was a, a major advancement. I think there are quotes in George's book of, around the human genome project and sort of the scale of, um, of what we achieved there to actually have that. But in fact, when it, so firstly, it, it wasn't the most thorough genome that it could have been. And in fact, it, there are, I think, I'm gonna probably get the timing wrong, but I'll say around a months or two years ago, there was a republishing of the human genome with much higher coverage and much more in information dense than we had previously seen in the original human genome project. And that has implications because when we were, when originally there were these sort of single genes being um, patented, um, a lot of the thinking was that really the important stuff would be proteins. So, and that's kind of where you get this genomic DNA versus cDNA. Um, that was referred to earlier and is, is covered in the book. But actually, we, we now know that the protein coding is only just a very small amount of the DNA within the human genome that is significant to human health. And so there's now a whole vast 
like non-coding, we call it DNA, um, that's, that it still would be kind of covered by the patent. It's still, it's still a DNA sequence, but um, it's just it, our scientific knowledge about what DNA sequences actually mean and what they impact and what they don't and to what extent they're important or not um, has really changed. And so the idea of how much of the human genome is covered by a particular pattern, I think that, that came up a number of times in like, if you, if you select any 15 base pair sequence that covers that. Once we now know the full extent of the human genome, we know the amount that is covered. Some of it is it, what we thought was junk is actually relevant, <laughs> which has implications for the downstream effects. Some of what we thought was relevant is probably junk. So, so as, as our like thinking evolves, I think there's just there's a there's a kind of keeping up um, that needs to happen there. And in personalized medicine, I think it just totally, like you say, it just changes the the nature of how we're not only um, you know protecting the, in, the intellectual property point, but also the manufacturing process and the kind of way that we um, treat patients is totally changing. So I don't really have so much to say on the legal aspects of precision medicine because it's not my field, but. I mean, it's definitely um, massively affecting uh, the sort of timeline for treatment in terms of you having to harvest cells from people, sometimes edit them, put them back into the patient. If you're using cell therapies, um, if you're identifying very in particular drug regimes, that takes a lot of time in the background to kind of check through. So I think I think it's really changing the technical aspect and it's making it a much, um, I think to your point, it is definitely making it a treatment process that involves many, many, many aspects of inventions, processes, drugs. And, and so that makes the whole field more complex. If you want to kind of, um, you know, uh, bring down a patent as the sort of the pub pact scheme is trying to do, like identifying individual patents that will be a breakthrough in access to medicine. If we're in the precision medicine space, that's clearly not going to be a tactic anymore. So maybe you have to think of different strategies to get around those issues. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel? Uh, I would just uh, thank you, Jenny. I, I can't. I can't top that. But um, I will say so. Uh, you know, again, the, the technology of the book primarily relates to an earlier generation. Although the precision medicine era was was just dawning at, at the very end of this book, and there's in the epilogue there's a a little uh, a segment about. Um, the Precision Medicine Initiative, now the All of Us Initiative in the United States, which was sort of arose out of this whole set of events where one of the uh, characters uh, directly talked with President Obama um, to get the Precision Medicine Initiative kicked off, and some of the people in the book were involved in, in that. And then, you know, their view, their view was that this outcome would help the world of precision medicine. Whereas, if you look at the uh, the bloggers, the the patent law bloggers, uh, some of whom were the most entertaining um, people to interact with for this book, you know, one of them, Gene Quinn at IP Watchdog, said, you know, precision medicine is dead. You know, let's declare it dead and buried. Um, goodbye. You know, that the, the, there are no patents on every aspect of this. It's not going to happen. So. Very different views, right? I mean, people knew that precision medicine was coming down the pike, but what to do in terms of policy to promote it? Completely opposite views, and I think we still don't know. Daniel. Um, so just one thought, which would possibly links the point by Trevor with your uh, point. So one of the interesting things that's mentioned in, in the book, of course, is the kind of rhetoric about some of these issues. And there's quite an amusing part where uh, you talk about the public uh, uh, <laughs> relations aspect mm. of the case, which says, well, let's make it about, I'm going to copy it here, was, uh, women's health, advancing science, right, fight against cancer. What we can't say is that this is about the product of nature doctrine and standing to bring suit, <laughs> which in fact is what the case <laughs> was about. You know? And uh, so Trevor's point, I think, is, well, actually, there's quite a lot of, in a sense, misinformation in this area. And the, 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 and the so, so when people say, you know, it's about owning your genes and so on, it's like, oh, it's not, not quite correct. But in some senses, it is, it is elliptical for a concept of, you know, how much money should someone else be able to make out of you, in a very broad sense, which is a very big uh, topic. 
And that comes back to the points that I think both of you were making on uh, the way in which science develops. And I think you made a particularly interesting point on the variety of different kinds of things that are required to do precision medicine. In the sort of old world of pharmaceuticals, as well, I've just got the API, you know, I make a salt, okay, there's nothing to do bigger than that, you know? Uh, that's really very boring, because all you can do is claim one right on the basic medicinal chemistry. No, there's no money in the vat, well, unless you're certain kinds of drugs. No, 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 what you want is something where you can take a turn on every possible opportunity. You know, you've got the fundamental sequence, you know, some of them make money out of that, but then you've got the construction of whatever it is, the, the platform, that's an mRNA platform, and then you've got the construction of the um, preservatives or whatever. And the reason I say this is having been involved in a number of cases, uh, it is actually shocking how much stuff goes into making even sort of inverted commas basic drugs, because they're not like that anymore. They're not like uh, sort of conventional vehicles, uh, uh, conventional drugs, any more than the motor vehicle is a conventional vehicle. A motor vehicle now is a mobile phone on wheels. It is, you can't repair it without software. And if you can't repair it without software, you can't repair it without a software license. And so you can't do it. So every time you need a license, someone makes money in, in relation to this. And so this whole issue, which is partly related to, I think your point, which is about data-driven medicine. This personalized medicine is partly data about the individual, partly collective data. It's a very complex set of data, some of which is physically embodied. One thinks about it being embodied. You know, mRNA, you might say, is the, the, the ultimate biological data carrier. <laughs> yeah. um, but there are many others uh, of, of, of key, key importance. And so these issues about who should be able to make money at which terms and how much and how this is regulated are issues which I don't think are quite enough in public consciousness because the public consciousness of the inventor of the pharmaceutical is the kind of 1950s uh, model, it's kind of Glaxo or whoever doing some sort of political medicine of chemistry, just as the model of the uh, um, engineering inventor is the kind of guy in a garret somewhere <laughs> with a sort of light bulb moment. When this is simply not how science exists, and we have a patent system, not just a patent system, but a patent system embedded in a regulatory system, a subsidy system, an insurance system, a, a price control uh, mechanism system in different countries where you cannot look at either the product or the legislative framework by just looking at one of the elements in isolation. And your point on multifarious uh, contributions is the key linchpin that underlies that. Yeah, it's very complex. I mean, especially if you're moving to kind of biological products from lots of chemical products, it's, it's yeah, very complicated. And I also wanted to ask George, really following up from what Dana has just said and, and Trevor's earlier comment, what happened to all the data that uh, they have collected? Because in a sense, they do own the genome. If they collected all that data, you know? They, they, and they, they realized, even before this lawsuit, right, that, that the data would be a valuable asset, right? And their patent, they knew, their patent lawyers knew by, in 2004 that their patents would expire. Um, while they still could make a good business out of this test. And, and so they decided to hold their data close and not give it away. Previously, the academic scientists, there was a big breast cancer uh, genetics consortium that all of the breast cancer you know, genetics researchers would share their data publicly, and, and they did. And, and Myriad researchers and the researchers at the University of Utah who were affiliated, they stopped that, they stopped that precisely in, in anticipation of the end of the patents. And, um, and that, that was very valuable for them for many years. They just this year announced uh, that, that they would release that data. Um, but it's been a long time, <laughs> decades in, in coming. They have, they have and, and there yet again, uh, they're on the campus of the University of Utah. Uh, they, they keep building new buildings. They seem to be doing very nicely for themselves. So it's, you know. They survived this, this uh, old and defeated country. Okay, do we have more questions from the audience? Lisa? 
Thank you so much for this. It was very interesting. And I hope you'll forgive me because normally my research focuses on patent law, but I come to you with a literary question because you probably don't notice, but I actually was very, became very interested in patents because of Michael Crichton. <laughs> so, and uh, I was actually recently going through his backlog again, and um, I read Next again, and to my great delight, I came across a paper by you responding to Michael Crichton's points on uh, approach in biotech and patenting. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very delighted and a little scared also that he's also in a future to get in your book because, as I said, I am a fan of his work, even though I do not always agree with him. And uh, in your paper, you were critical of some of the points he made, some of the views that he had on how to approach uh, biotech and, and, and patenting in that way. And I was actually kind of wondering, um, I haven't read it yet, sorry, but have you kind of come to terms with Michael Crichton <laughs> since that paper? <laughs> Please forgive me, it's a silly question I know. But <laughs> so, so, so for those who don't know, Michael Crichton, uh, his 2006 book, Next, is a biotech thriller. Um, it does involve patents, and he goes on the warpath against uh, biotech patents and uh, of all kinds. And, um, my, I, I was most offended by his characterization of the director of the National Institutes of Health as being this very aggressive pro-patent business person, which, again, this, it's a novel, it's a work of fiction, he can say whatever he wants, but Francis Collins, the actual director of the NIH, was one of the prime opponents of gene patenting, <laughs> who actually did convince the Solicitor General to intervene in this case on behalf of the ACLU, not Myriad. So I was, I was a little bit upset with Michael Crichton, but he did a great service by, you know, being an advocate against, um, you know, certain abuses in the biotech industry. And, and he was, he is in the book, right? He, he helps Tanya Simoncelli, he goes to Washington with them, helps them to, to understand about lobbying. They, they fly in his jet down to D.C. <laughs> um, to do a lobbying trip. So it's all quite fascinating. He, he, he died in 2006.